Greetings from Washington, D.C. Welcome to the virtual IMF press briefing on Asia and Pacific. This is Keiko Utsunomiya from the Communications Department. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to join us today. Um, we have already received some questions, but uh, please uh, send your questions if you're on the IMF Press Center. And if you're on the WebEx, um, please um, raise your hand or um, send your questions, brief questions, using the chat function. Now, uh, let me introduce today's speaker. I'm here at the IMF's studio with Mr. Jonathan Ostry. He's the deputy director of the IMF's Asia and Pacific Department. He's going to sh give a short opening remarks on the latest economic outlook for the region, and then we will take questions. Jonathan. Thanks very much, Keiko, and warm greetings uh, from Washington, D.C., and good evening to you in Asia. It's a real pleasure to be with you and to give you some of the highlights of the IMF's regional economic outlook for Asia Pacific. The pandemic has resulted in unprecedented output losses in the Asia Pacific region. Losses varied widely across economies as a function of the stringency and effectiveness of containment policies, dependence on tourism and contact intensive services, and the degree of policy support. Some of the Pacific Island countries have been among the worst affected. Although recovery is now underway and the pandemic is receding in some countries, elsewhere, second and third waves of infections are raging, notably in India and some of the ASEAN economies. While exports and manufacturing generally have held up due to surging global demand for pandemic-related supplies, services are taking longer to recover, adding to sectoral divergence. The pandemic has increased income inequality by disproportionately hurting low-wage and informal earners, as well as young and female workers. Divergence is thus multidimensional across countries and within countries across sectors, age groups, gender, and skill level. A region known for its trademark growth with equity model now runs the risk of entrenching excessive inequality. Let me turn to some of our detailed country-level forecasts. Overall, we expect regional growth to come in just above 7.5% this year and just short of 5.5% next year. While these averages are a welcome rebound from last year's contraction, they, mark significant, they mask significant heterogeneity at the country level, and this divergence seems likely to persist. For China, growth has been marked up to 8.4% this year due to stronger net exports, reflecting higher global growth and the U.S. fiscal stimulus. India has seen a more sizable upward revision to 12.5% on account of continued normalization of its economy and a more growth-friendly fiscal policy. But the current surge in infections presents a worrisome downside risk. Revisions have generally been positive for the advanced economies in the region. Australia's growth projection has been revised up to 4.5%, given the better-than-expected outturn in the final quarter of last year and healthier domestic demand expected this year. The outlook for the Japanese economy has improved thanks to unprecedented domestic policy support and favorable external conditions, with growth in 2021 now projected at 3.3%, and 2.5% next year. For Korea, growth should pick up to 3.6% this year and moderate to 2.8% in 2022, driven by favorable external environments and for manufacturing and for exports. Against these upward revisions, 
Growth in the ASEAN economies has been marked down to 4.5 percent, given still high COVID-19 caseloads in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, which will slow the pace of normalization in contact intensive sectors. The outlook for tourism is also expected to remain subdued, affecting prospects in Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. The humanitarian crisis in Myanmar gravely concerns us all. In addition to the tragic loss of life, we project that the coup will have a devastating impact on livelihoods that could last well into the medium term. South Asia, excluding India, is recovering, led by Bangladesh, due to higher-than-expected exports and remittances, notwithstanding the recent spike in infections. Outlooks in Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka are affected by weak tourism and limited policy space. The pandemic is inflicting a devastating toll on the Pacific Island countries, particularly those highly dependent on tourism and volatile commodities trade. This will add to pre-existing vulnerabilities, not only because of uncertainty about when borders reopen and tourism recovers, but also due to ongoing natural disaster and climate risks, stresses from high debt and over-leveraged balance sheets, diminished policy space, and dwindling correspondent banking relationships. The recovery in Asia depends on a smooth handoff from public support to private demand. After the historically unprecedented stimulus in 2020, fiscal policy in the region is expected to continue to do its part this year, with the fiscal stance remaining supportive in the region. However, there is notable cross-country variation with some economies expected to soon begin moderating fiscal support on the back of strong health indicators and large stimulus last year. The evolution of current account positions will reflect a balance between positive spillovers from the U.S. fiscal stimulus and waning demand for pandemic-related supplies. There is huge uncertainty surrounding our projections. Setbacks in the vaccine rollout, questions about the potency of the vaccine against new variants of the disease, and a resurgence of the virus, together constitute a key downside risk. On the upside, however, a faster vaccine rollout would propel the economic recovery. Strong international cooperation remains essential to ensure adequate vaccine production and universal distribution at affordable prices. In this respect, the efforts of China and India have been commendable, and we hope both countries continue to make supplies available to other countries while ensuring adequate supplies at home. The changing external environment is a central driver of risk in the region, given Asia's outward orientation to trade and capital flows. For export-oriented economies in Asia with strong linkages to the United States, the U.S. fiscal expansion will provide positive spillovers through the trade channel. But U.S. interest rates are already on an upward trajectory, and this is spilling over to Asian emerging market economies. If U.S. yields rise faster than markets expect, or if there's miscommunication about future U.S. monetary policy, adverse spillovers through financial channels and capital outflows, as during the 2013 taper tantrum, could present challenges by compromising macrofinancial stability. The consequences will vary according to country-specific trade and financial linkages, the share of folding ho foreign holdings of Asia's government debt has diminished in recent years, reducing exposure to the changing risk appetite of non-resident investors. In addition, greater official reserve holdings, more flexible exchange rates, stronger supervision of bank balance sheets, and better anchored inflationary expectations 
should together help to dampen the impact of any faltering in foreign investors' risk appetite. However, the increase in leverage across government, household, and corporate balance sheets means that higher borrowing costs, when they occur, will hurt. What is the message? If I choose only one, it is for divergence to be vigorously countered across all the dimensions I described. History must not be allowed to become destiny. A first priority is to ensure that vaccines are widely available and to overcome vaccine hesitancy. Boosting vaccine supply and administration capacity are essential to underpin the recovery. Fiscal support targeted towards vulnerable groups should remain accommodative until private demand recovers. Broad lifelines should be phased out only gradually as the pandemic recedes, and future support should then be geared to achieve needed reallocation of resources toward new, dynamic, green and digital sectors. Even now, policymakers need to be attentive to anchoring public debt in credible medium-term frameworks, especially where fiscal space and buffers have been eroded. Monetary policy should continue to be data-dependent, attendant to macroeconomic and financial stability risks. The challenges going forward are considerable, given changes in the international environment, the possibility of renewed bouts of capital outflows, and the risks from inflated housing markets in some countries. Policymakers will need to deploy the multiple instruments in their toolkits to safeguard macrofinancial stability in this challenging environment. A renewed structural reform drive is essential to boost productivity and output to potential while fostering greener and more inclusive growth. Let me mention three imperatives. First, trade has been a powerful driver of growth and poverty alleviation in Asia for decades. It has been a cornerstone of the Asian miracle. To fulfill Asia's potential for trade-led growth, restrictions that impede trade need to be reduced. These include tariffs and non-tariff barriers, such as quotas, subsidies, local content rules, and licensing requirements, where progress has stalled since the 1990s. Notwithstanding welcome recent regional initiatives, such as the RCEP and CPTPP. Easing of trade and technology tensions and facilitation of digital trade would also provide a welcome fillip to growth. Second, corporate debt vulnerabilities, especially among small and medium enterprises, need to be addressed by pivoting from pandemic liquidity support to solvency support so as to facilitate balance sheet repair, enable zombie firms to exit, and allow dynamic entrants to thrive. Pandemic support policies, while necessary in the short term, have obscured pre-pandemic vulnerabilities and allowed unviable firms to continue operating. As such policies are withdrawn, insolvency frameworks need to be strengthened to allow non-viable firms to exit while assuring adequate credit flow to productive firms and facilitating fresh equity capital to help companies overcome debt overhangs and grow job opportunities. Third, the welcome shift toward a greener energy mix during the pandemic must now catalyze further efforts to advance the green agenda. Increased investment in green technologies, coupled with higher carbon prices, are essential to reduce emissions. Policies should build on recent country initiatives, including incentives for energy-efficient vehicles in China, tax rebates for efficient home appliances in Korea, and support for climate-resilient infrastructure in Japan. Policy strategies need to internalize political economy considerations and limit adverse distributional impacts. Only in such cases 
will greener growth be politically sustainable? In this respect, safety nets to compensate losers and trampoline policies to allow workers to shift from declining to new sectors will need to be improved. I thank you for your attention and look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, um, I would like to turn to the WebEx. Um, I see Mr. Anthony Rowley from South China Morning Post. Anthony, please go ahead. I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can. Okay, good. All right. Okay, well, uh, basically, I, I have two questions. Um, the first one concerns supply chains, manufacturing supply chains in Asia. Um, you know, the um, US China tensions and the trade war, tra trade wars that have taken place and the imminence of tech wars, it's been suggested that um, su supply chains will bifurcate into two, in effect, one serving China, another serving uh, the US and some of its allies. So my first question is, um, what's your view about on this? And secondly, is there any concrete evidence this bifurcation is actually taking place yet? That's my first question. The second question is, is different, um, emissions of CO2, carbon dioxide. I mean. In China, India, Russia, Japan, to some extent, we have enormous emissions of CO2 caused by coal-fired power stations. And some experts are suggesting that whatever these countries do, they're not going to be able to meet their COP26 targets or any future targets because they're simply using too much coal and they're on track to go on doing so. So what's your view on that, please? Very good. Well, thank you for those uh, those two questions. I'll, I'll start with uh, the trade issue and then uh, come to the the to the, the green uh, future for the region uh, issue. So um, I think it's important to to give the context on trade. Uh, trade plunged uh, last year um, uh, following you know a period of of healthy growth in trade. Um, but the main, the main factor driving uh, the poor performance of trade uh, last year was not uh, really the trade tensions. Um, uh, it was the pandemic and the ramifications uh, from that. We expect uh, trade to recover this year, uh, to rebound, uh, uh, essentially offsetting the contraction that we saw uh, last year. And then uh, post uh, reasonable uh, uh, growth over the medium term. Uh, that being said, um, the trade tensions uh, have been costly. They've been costly uh, for the main parties to the tensions, and they've been uh, costly to the world. Uh, we estimate that the uh, US China tariffs. Um, uh, have inflicted costs of something uh, just short of a half a percent of global GDP. Uh, and uh, in an environment where, uh, you know, growth has uh, suffered uh, a very bad recession, um, this has been uh, a self-inflicted wound. Um, so we uh, have uh, repeatedly called for all the parties uh, to try and work toward a uh, multilateral uh, based uh, solution, uh, a rules-based solution, uh, reinvigor reinvigorating the multilateral rules-based system, strengthening its institutions, and um, uh, confronting uh, the, the various issues that uh, led to uh, the trade crisis. Um, you uh, mentioned the uh, risks of uh, bifurcation. Uh, and whether uh, there is any evidence of such bifurcation uh, at present. And uh, my answer to that is uh, uh, we don't see much ev evidence of this, uh, of this bifurcation. Uh, and we, we do take uh, comfort in that because um, uh, the, the risk of this, uh, uh, these trade tensions 
morphing into uh, uh, technology tensions uh, and technological decoupling um, would uh, inflict uh, much larger costs on the global economy, uh, maybe an order of magnitude larger uh, in extreme situations uh, than the ones wrought by uh, the tariff, uh, the tariff uh, tensions. So again, we very much hope uh, that uh, we revert to a, uh, a strong multilateral uh, rules-based system um, that can uh, fully address uh, the, uh, the, the various issues that have amplified the risks of technological decoupling. Technological decoupling, decoupling is, is so dangerous uh, because, um, you know, China and the U.S. are, uh, are, are tech hubs for the world. Um, and so um, if uh, those tensions uh, were to uh, get red hot, um, there would be uh, not only a chilling effect on uh, tech in, 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 uh, in trade in high-tech products, um, there would also be uh, a move to much less efficient uh, production across the world as uh, global value changes, chains um, uh, sort of uh, were, were adversely affected to, toward less efficient uh, structures, uh, and this would reduce productivity, uh, and there would be a chilling effect on, on knowledge uh, diffusion uh, throughout the region and throughout the world. So uh, these are our recipes for uh, poor productivity and growth performance going po forward, and we very much hope uh, they can be avoided. Now, let me turn to your uh, second question uh, on uh, the, the green agenda, the green recovery. Uh, and let me start out by saying that uh, this is uh, an existential issue for the world and an existential issue for the region. Uh, let, me, let me focus on the region since uh, uh, this, we are here to talk about Asia Pacific. Um, and Asia Pacific uh, uh, has this existential threat by, uh, from not addressing climate change um, because uh, first and foremost, Asia contains, as your, as your question uh, indicated, uh, a, a number of the world's largest uh, emitters, uh, including China and India, uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Korea. Um, and it includes, of course, very close to home, some of the world's most polluted cities. Uh, and pollution in these uh, large metropolitan areas uh, include, uh, induces huge uh, health costs uh, every year uh, and even uh, pollution-related deaths. So this is uh, a powerful issue for the citizens uh, uh, in this region, including in uh, these very polluted cities. Um, in addition, uh, the region includes some of the most vulnerable countries uh, to climate change uh, and climate-related natural disasters. And here I think of the incredibly vulnerable Pacific Island economies, uh, where the frequency of natural uh, disasters has increased over time, uh, and climate risk uh, is huge, and the uh, needed investments uh, to uh, uh, address uh, adaptation needs are monumental and far exceed uh, the uh, investment uh, financing capacity of, uh, of these countries. So this is a huge issue, uh, both for the large emitters and for uh, the countries that are facing uh, huge adaptation costs and climate risks. My feeling uh, is that uh, the large em em uh, emitters uh, have um, uh, understood very well uh, the need to confront this challenge. Um, in uh, the recent past, we have seen uh, the large em emitters uh, commit to carbon neutrality uh, in 2050 or 2060. Uh, this includes both advanced economies uh, like uh, Japan or Korea. 
and it also includes, uh, very notably, China. Um, and I think we have seen uh, the beginnings of uh, the uh, set of measures that these countries um, uh, plan in order to achieve uh, their commitments. Um, uh, we have seen, for example, in China, uh, the coal tax, uh, the national uh, 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 emission trading schemes, we have seen uh, in Japan in the third supplementary uh, budget uh, a, a, a number of interesting uh, 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 investments in, uh, in, in their green future. Uh, India has uh, recommitted uh, to its uh, uh, Paris Accords, uh, and there is indeed uh, certainly the potential for India to exceed uh, those, uh, those commitments at its discretion. Uh, Korea uh, has uh, launched uh, the Korean New Deal uh, with, um, uh, with a significant uh, green, green component. Um, you know, at a global scale, I think uh, Asia has heard the message um, uh, that uh, green investments uh, and raising carbon prices um, are uh, pro-growth, pro-equity policy, uh, and over time, uh, that combination of uh, higher carbon prices and green investments would uh, produce millions of jobs, perhaps on the order of 12 million jobs uh, uh, over uh, a decade. Uh, and uh, large gains uh, to global GDP. So Asia has heard this message. Uh, is it the case uh, that every component of the strategy to get from A to B has been nailed down? Uh, no. Um, uh, so uh, this is uh, a work in progress, uh, and we need uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, focus on the implementation, focus on the full package of policies. But uh, I am convinced that uh, Asia uh, large emitters uh, have, have uh, heard the message and the need um, uh, and are beginning to do uh, what, what, is, what is required. Um, I would also say that for uh, those in, in this region who face uh, huge financing needs, uh, maybe on average 3% uh, of GDP, but in some of uh, the smaller Pacific Islands, uh, easily in the double-digit percent of GDP, uh, the international community is going to have to uh, step up to the plate to assist in providing uh, grants and climate financing on a highly concessional favorable terms. Let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, related to Anthony's first question, um, I believe Maulin has a uh, um, question on trade. Maulin, please go ahead. Um, we have to turn on your microphone. Oh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Keiko. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I do have a question related to trade. Uh, firstly, you mentioned that trade has been a powerful driver of growth and poverty innovation in Asia for decades, and the MF welcomes recent original initiatives such as the RCEP and uh, CPTPP. And how would the implementation of RCEP impact Asia's economic recovery and global recovery? And would an early implementation be helpful? And secondly, just to follow up on the green agenda question, um, China aims to aims for carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, how does that fit in the full picture of the region's uh, green agenda? And what role do we expect China uh, to play in the process? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for those those two questions. So um, I think what we've seen uh, over over the years, indeed decades, and as I mentioned in in my opening. Uh, Asia is inherently uh, an open trading region. Um, and uh, even as there were global trade tensions, Asia sought uh, to invigorate 
uh, regional uh, trade liberalization. And the RCEP that you mentioned is uh, a case in point. It brings together uh, many, many countries, but including uh, three regional giants of China, Japan, and Korea uh, uh, for the first time in a common uh, regional agreement. Um, RCEP uh, is not uh, as deep uh, uh, an agreement as some uh, of the others uh, that, uh, that have been passed in, in recent years, uh, but it nevertheless uh, has the potential to deepen uh, trade between Northeast and Southeast Asia. Uh, and I would highlight in particular uh, the uh, uh, reductions in uh, local content rules uh, as uh, providing a powerful impetus for uh, greater uh, trade in the region. I would also see a powerful signaling um, uh, you know, benefit from the RCEP. Uh, the global environment has been extremely challenging, and yet Asia was able to conclude uh, this, um, this agreement in this challenging environment, sending uh, a, a very powerful signal of its commitment uh, to, to open and liberal trade. Um, there is uh, more to do, uh, especially uh, in areas, for example, of e-commerce, services, investment. Uh, and of course, we all hope uh, that future agreements uh, can address those issues. But I see RCEP uh, as a, uh, a very welcome uh, step for the region. Uh, I, I would just add, you know, there are um, estimates out there of, of relatively small static gains uh, uh, accruing as a result of RCEP. But frequently, these studies uh, underestimate the total gains because the larger gains are dynamic uh, and occur over time through investment, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as investment decisions are affected. So, so again, I see, I see some potential there. Um, you asked also about uh, uh, China and uh, its, its role in, in uh, uh, you know, greening the recovery uh, in the in the region, I would say that um, you know uh, the green agenda requires uh, global cooperation. It requires uh, regional cooperation. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, each nation has to make uh, its own sovereign decisions, and people are moving uh, at, at different speeds on this. We uh, very much hope that uh, China's commitment to carbon neutrality by 2060 will set a powerful example because uh, uh, everyone does need to move um, uh, together on this global issue. Uh, and so we hope very much that uh, China's commitments uh, will uh, invigorate the green agenda uh, uh, th throughout the region. Uh, uh, by, by setting an example uh, and by showing uh, leadership. Let me stop there. Thank you. Um, another um, questioner from the WebEx, Ender, uh, and Mr. Ender Curran from Bloomberg. Are you there? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Okay. Keiko. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. I, yeah, good, thank you. Could I just ask uh, Jonathan, please, a question on productivity? You mentioned it briefly earlier. Um, there is an accelerated pickup of technology going on around Asia and the world right now because of the pan pandemic. And there is a view that this will boost productivity, you know, automation, robots and the like. Do you have any views on whether this will boost productivity or, or is that not the case? Thank you. So uh, let, me, let me say a couple things about the productivity question and the role of automation. Um, we are seeing, I think, um, and we also know from uh, past recessions and severe crises, uh, that automation, increased automation, um, is uh, often the result. Um, and, and new technologies, uh, greater automation, uh, can expand uh, the production possibilities frontier, can make uh, economies uh, uh, more productive. 
Uh, but there is uh, an important policy challenge that needs uh, to be confronted in, in these uh, times, which is to ensure that um, the human costs of uh, technological innovations are uh, not, uh, not ignored. Uh, and what that means is that we need to equip uh, workers, uh, including those uh, who may not be as skilled uh, and able to uh, be productively employed in uh, higher technology sectors, we need to equip them uh, with the capacity uh, to have a fair shot in the new, more digital, and indeed greener economies that we hope Asia will move uh, toward in the future. So this speaks to the need for, first, providing adequate social safety nets, uh, and second, more, more importantly, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my intro, um, trampoline policies, education, skill development, lifelong learning, uh, to allow uh, workers throughout the region, uh, including uh, significant informal uh, workers who have suffered uh, disproportionately, the low-skilled, the youth, uh, uh, women, all of uh, these part, integral parts of the labor forces, uh, they need to be equipped uh, to deal with the more digital, more automized economy uh, that is coming uh, 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 in, in order for uh, the recovery, uh, the, the digital recovery, to be inclusive and thus uh, sustainable. Uh, there is always a danger if people are left behind uh, that inequality uh, rises, uh, and in an extreme case, uh, this can lead uh, to social unrest, as we uh, documented in our uh, last regional economic outlook. Uh, and this is a, a recipe uh, for non-inclusive and much more fragile growth, and obviously not uh, a direction in which we want to head. Let me stop there. Uh, one more question from the WebEx, uh, Ms. Jihan Du from Caixin Media. Please go ahead. Hi. We can um, hear you. Thank you very much. My question is about uh, the ASEAN countries. The ASEAN five um, countries growth has been cut again in the latest WEO, and the possible reasons behind would be a spike of the pandemic and a slower recovery of the tourism. So my question is, um, would IMF support a region-wide vaccination passport across all, all those countries and encourage the vaccination and boost tourism? Um, or would there be any other methods or suggestions you would have for those countries? Thank you very much. Th thank you very much for that question. Um, so uh, we, we've all been reading in the newspapers discussions of COVID passports, um, and those, uh, those discussions will, will continue. What we have emphasized is the need for accelerating uh, the vaccine rollout, for uh, uh, assuring um, fast universal distribution at affordable prices uh, throughout the uh, Asia-Pacific region uh, and indeed uh, the world. Only once uh, populations are fully vaccinated will we get back to uh, a, a, a healthy, sustainable recovery. Uh, and that is uh, urgently needed. Uh, there is no better investment that countries uh, can make, that the world can make right now than moving faster uh, to ensure this outcome. Uh, as we've said, you know, a faster universal rollout of uh, vaccines would add something on the order of $9 trillion uh, to the global economy. I, I challenge anybody to find a uh, better bang for an investment buck uh, than uh, accelerating the vaccine rollout. So, so that is the key. Now, um, as you've said, the, uh, the ASEAN region uh, is in the throes of uh, 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 you know, a, 
a, a resurgence of the pandemic, most notably in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Uh, and so uh, vaccine rollouts there uh, are urgently needed, and uh, the containment policies uh, to deal with the transition to the vaccine rollout uh, will, will be costly economically, but they are necessary. Uh, in addition, um, you know, tourism is an important uh, uh, driver of growth in many of these countries, uh, notably uh, Thailand, but also Cambodia and Laos. Uh, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, there, there is an important uh, degree of uncertainty uh, exactly about um, when tourism can uh, return, when borders can reopen. Uh, this is going to uh, 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 be dependent on the, the global progress with the vaccine, as well, frankly, as the health protocols that are uh, introduced uh, at the country level uh, to host uh, tourists coming from abroad. Uh, we have seen different protocols. We have seen, for example, in the Maldives uh, that uh, tourism uh, has uh, rebounded much better than anyone uh, would have expected. And this has a lot to do with the specific protocols that Maldives uh, has introduced. But um, and we, we are seeing, uh, you know, travel bubble, bubbles um, uh, uh, pop up here, here and there, including Australia and New Zealand very recently. So uh, the different protocols uh, and, and, and passport, uh, COVID passports may be part of that, but uh, I, don't, I don't have any strong views on that question. Thanks. Okay. While we are on the ASEAN, uh, I would like to take a question from uh, Mr. Nguyen Tan Thun, Vietnam Investment Review on Vietnam. Um, the uh, Vietnamese economy grew 2.91% in 2020 and 4.48% in the first quarter of 2021. How the IMF view the economy has driven itself forward with the use of um, um, fiscal monetary policy tools, uh, or, uh, uh, oh, sorry, in addition to other tools? Um, what are the IMF's recommendations for the country to achieve its set targets, set growth targets? Well, I, I'm very happy to, to uh, see this question on Vietnam because Vietnam uh, performed uh, much better than uh, virtually all of the uh, countries in our region uh, last year, uh, uh, a rare positive growth number in a sea of negatives. Um, and this was due mainly to the incredibly proactive uh, and effective uh, set of uh, containment uh, policies introduced very, very early in 2020, um, and really showed what can be achieved uh, with a uh, strong health response um, and it, 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 it sort of manifests itself um, in a, a, a strong pickup in, in growth. Uh, the fact that prolonged uh, lockdowns were not uh, uh, needed, um, so reopening uh, could uh, proceed much faster than uh, elsewhere. And uh, when uh, inevitably uh, one or two uh, localized outbreaks um, uh, occurred. The authorities were vigorous in uh, attending to those and did so very effectively. And there was a payoff also in that uh, macroeconomic policy support um, uh, on a huge scale was not needed uh, in Vietnam. So uh, again, it is, it is a, a situation where the investment in a strong healthcare response uh, repays itself many times over. Um, now, uh, for 2021, uh, the IMF is uh, uh, projecting uh, uh, very healthy growth uh, in, in Vietnam, uh, I think on the order of 6 or 7 percent. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, the, the message uh, that we have is to uh, make sure that you are continuing uh, to support uh, uh, those who are vulnerable in your economy, as you have been doing. 
uh, and uh, uh, continue uh, with the vaccine rollout, which has uh, just started uh, in Vietnam and is, is uh, hopefully going to be uh, accelerated very, very quickly, um, and uh, lay the foundation uh, for uh, uh, strong uh, medium-term growth, uh, including um, making sure you have uh, the tax and revenue uh, uh, resources uh, to uh, build your infrastructure uh, and build public investment, ensure your financial uh, system is, uh, is resilient, uh, and uh, continue uh, with um, uh, efforts to, uh, to build the uh, pro-private investment uh, 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 environment in Vietnam uh, uh, structurally on a structural basis, uh, 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 which will also have a payoff uh, uh, in terms of reducing uh, uh, external uh, imbalances uh, and the strength of the external position in Vietnam. I'll stop there. Okay. Um, turn, turning to South Asia, we have a question from Mr. Sega Gihimir from uh, News Business Age. Um, isn't the 2.9% projection for Nepal high as tourism hasn't recovered and remittances, uh, remittance, remittance is likely to take a hit? Low-income countries have limited resources to support economies. Ex uh, except for the IMF, other organizations haven't provided much debt relief. How should they respond, uh, the government, respond to COVID's shockwaves? Thanks very much uh, for that question on uh, Nepal. Um, the, the question was really asking, are, we, are our projections for Nepal um, on the optimistic side? Uh, and I, my sense is that they are uh, reasonable uh, uh, at this point. Um, there is a natural uh, rebound that will um, uh, statistically uh, uh, flatter uh, the growth uh, the growth number in 2021. Um, but more importantly, um, we assume that uh, as the containment measures in the non-tourism uh, sectors are, are unwound, uh, there, there will be uh, some recovery in the, in the non-tourism uh, economy. Um, so I, I think this would be uh, uh, a driver uh, of growth uh, this year. Um, on financing, uh, uh, the questioner uh, uh, will recognize that the IMF provided uh, emergency financing uh, uh, last year, which uh, uh, helped to uh, uh, support the uh, uh, pandemic response uh, in Nepal. And of course, Nepal will have to work closely with its uh, international uh, multilateral partners uh, to continue to um, uh, access uh, 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 concessional financing and grant financing uh, to support its uh, development agenda. Uh, let me take two more questions, one on Bangladesh. Uh, this is from Mr. Zamil Woodin, Daily Star. Um, Bangladesh now faces a second wave of the coronavirus pandemic, which has already forced the government to impose strict, uh, strict restrictions on movement once again after last year. Uh, what types of fiscal measures should the government take to resolve the pandemic-induced economic downturn? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, indeed, uh, Bangladesh... Um, is in the throes of, uh, uh, of another wave of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and this uh, is presenting uh, challenges and, and downside uh, risks to growth. Uh, the challenge for policy uh, is to uh, sustain the effective response uh, that Bangladesh um, uh, made during the uh, initial phase uh, of the pandemic, including supporting its uh, most vulnerable uh, through uh, social safety nets, through support for the agricultural sector, 
uh, and and so forth. So this this is uh, this is the challenge. Um, uh, going going forward, uh, there is uh, always the need uh, to strengthen uh, the the fiscal revenue uh, capacity uh, of the economy uh, to support uh, to support expenditures. Uh, and again, also working with uh, development partners um, uh, to to also uh, 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 help fiscal fiscal cushioning. Thank you. Okay, let me turn back to East Asia uh, for the last question. This is on Korea. Uh, Miss Yoon Byu Kim from Asia Business Daily, which is a Korean newspaper asking um, about Korea's monetary policy. Last year, Bank of Korea cut the interest rate to prevent economic shock. Uh, since the economic recovery is appearing, uh, do you think Korea should start considering the rate hike? And also, she's asking about uh, any advice about K-shaped recovery in Korea. Very good. Um, so, uh, on the uh, appropriateness of monetary policy, uh, I would say two things. I would say that uh, both fiscal and monetary policy uh, responded appropriately and effectively uh, to the pandemic and the macroeconomic costs that the pandemic uh, inflicted. Korea uh, is another uh, one of the uh, uh, countries in our region where uh, the growth numbers, uh, in a relative sense, uh, uh, were extremely good uh, last year. Uh, um, and the recovery is, uh, seems to be uh, well entrenched uh, for this year. Um, and that is uh, in no small measure due to the uh, uh, very effective macroeconomic policy support uh, provided both by fiscal and monetary policy. Um, on, on where monetary policy uh, should be headed now, we think uh, the, uh, the current level of interest rates uh, remains uh, appropriate, uh, given uh, the still substantial uh, slack in the economy uh, uh, and the fact that inflationary pressures are not yet uh, in evidence. On the financial stability side, um, we would not recommend um, uh, raising interest rates uh, to, uh, to contend with any financial stability risks, uh, including those related to uh, housing. Uh, yes, the questioner is right in terms of uh, the level of household debt uh, and the fact uh, that a lot of this household debt relates uh, to uh, mortgages and housing. Uh, but uh, we consider those financial stability risks uh, to be well contained uh, thanks to uh, the appropriate macroprudential policies uh, that uh, Korea has had uh, uh, during this uh, housing boom. So I will stop there. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. This will conclude our briefing today. I trust you have access to, um, to Jonathan's blog on the IMF website entitled after a strong crisis response, uh, Asia can build a fairer and greener future. Uh, the transcript and the video recording will be posted on our website as well. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Stay safe and see you next time, hopefully in person. Goodbye.